Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Um, welcome to uh, making your marketing app stack work for you. And all right. Uh, so who am I? So obviously, my name is Kerwai Lowe. I'm a marketer and a strategist by profession. I'm also a small business owner and a champion for all of my clients. On a personal level, I'm a traveler, a dancer, and a food explorer. One thing I recently realized is that I've been to 44 of the 50 states, and I've also been to 44 Top Chef alum restaurants. I don't know if there's any coincidences, but I'm hoping soon I'll be able to, to start doing both of those things again. Um, so I wanted to get to know everyone in the room. I think I actually know um, most of you. Uh, but uh, if you um, wanted to just chat who you are um, from a personal or personal standpoint, it'd be great to get to know folks. Um, as well as for you guys to get to know each other um, before we, we get started here. All right, so. Uh, I guess someone should go first. <laughs> uh, my name is Zaif Smith. I'm a commercial photographer. I'm also a partner in a design firm called Exhilarate and working on a tech startup for uh, in the recruitment space. Thanks, Dave, for sharing. And feel free to mute yourself during this whole presentation if you have any questions or add them into the chat box. I want to make those as interactive as possible, um, given our uh, you know virtual setting. Um, I will try to, like I said, unmute yourself if you have a question you want to ask verbally, just because it'll be easier for me to see versus like the nonverbal reactions. All right, so let's dive into uh, why we're here. So what is an app stack? Techopedia defines an app stack as a suite or set of application programs that help in performing a certain task. So in this case, the certain tasks that we're talking about is marketing. It could be business development, content marketing, your email campaigns, search, social media, but obviously marketing encompasses a lot more things. So, what are these applications that I'm talking about in the marketing space? So as many of you know, there are so many different um, small to medium business applications, so what I've been calling do-it-yourself applications and things that allow you to accomplish um, marketing tasks that are typically uh, only for, that have typically been sort of a marketing professional or an accounting professional sort of role. So for instance, you know, we talk about marketing, you think of email. So MailChimp is one of those examples, but you can also think about how business applications like um, Square have been, or have been integrated into marketing as well. So just out of curiosity, if anyone has any favorite apps that they use or platforms, I've used Shopify and uh, and Stripe. And what do you like about Shopify and Stripe? I mean, it's their plug and play apps. So instead of having like in the in the old days for us older, for us really old folks, uh, you don't have to spend a lot of time building things that just get plugged right in. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's been the beauty of a lot of these apps is that, you know, for tasks that you typically needed either someone to code something or someone who had, you know, particular expertise in um, a lot of these apps support that. I mean, I, I use the example of like uh, QuickBooks or FreshBooks a lot. I'm not an accountant. I don't have any desire to learn about the basics of accounting, but they make it really easy to sort of keep track of the, the accounting process for a small business for sure. I see a lot of uh, folks that are Canva fans. I'm also a Canva fan and we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a little bit. So with all of these applications, they're great, especially as we talked about sort of the, the ease of using it. But one of the things that I like to tell folks is to make sure you focus on your strategy first and then the tools as opposed to sort of let me pick the tools and then figure out how to use them. Um, in some cases, you may inherit tools that you need to um, figure out how to implement your strategy on the tool with the tools, um, but there's definitely ways to, to consider how to do that in a more strategic and efficient way. So getting back to a marketing app stack. So there's a lot of basic ways you can think about it. Um, I use this example with Instagram, you'll see on the, the left-hand side here where there are a lot of different apps that you can use to 
post content onto Instagram. So that's sort of your, your end result is wanting to be able to, to, you know, post something on social media. So you can use anything from Canva to design a graphic to post directly to Instagram. You can um, schedule something to post on Instagram with later. Um, and obviously layout and boomerang are other ways to create different forms of content. So that's like one way of thinking about a marketing app stack. Another way is thinking about how you take different content drivers and reuse that content. So we've talked about um, MailChimp being an email provider. So you've created an email, but you want to promote that content on social media. So there's ways to link your apps that way as well. So these are a fairly straightforward version of it. And the idea of, of creating these is to make your work more efficient. So not having to repeat processes, being able to, as I say, set it and forget it. So you can schedule things um, and really make use of um, inherent functionality with these, with these apps. So I wanted to dive into what I, I, I'm calling a case study, but the idea of um, creating content um, and posting it as well as promoting it. And so I, I'm focusing more on th the ways to think about what applications you use in, in this particular context um, and less about uh, specific marketing content strategies and that sort of thing. But if you have any questions about that or have any insight you want to share with the group, feel free to, to add it um, to the conversation. And so really what I'm focusing on is how can you take, um, oops, see, little, sorry, little tech text. How can you take a piece of content and officially post it and promote it across various marketing channels is really what I'm gonna cover in a moment. So the first thing is you need to develop the content, obviously. So imagine you already have the content developed and you need to figure out where you, you want to post it and what kind of supporting images or videos will accompany the text. And just to give you, as I mentioned, this is more about sort of the application side and not, not necessarily um, strategy side, but just for those who are interested, you know, blog posts do better when they do have images um, accompanying them. Um, you'll see that uh, according to Twitter, blog or uh, content tweet tweets, um, that have images get retweeted 35% more than tweets without content. Um, and what also is interesting is just from a blog standpoint is that um, the, the length of blog posts and content has gotten longer. So um, from a top 50, I think most read blog posts, they average 2,100 words to I think 2,400 words. And so there's a lot of things that you, you know, as you think of, as I mentioned, you want to think about strategically is that you want to figure out a way to create a home for your content that matches what strategically works the best. And so you don't ever want to give up effectiveness for efficiency. So um, just a couple of like ways to, that as you're thinking about applications, you should also think about the, the strategic development side as well. How much is um, keyword um, relative, to, is it still relative to blogging when you're trying to build um, organic growth on your platform? Is, is keyword still relevant in, in blogging? It, it is still relevant in blogging. Um, it is, um, there's, there's a couple ways to think about it. One of the things is um, not just loading your content with keywords, but really figuring out what your audience is searching for. So if you're trying to build like, for instance, if you're working on SEO stuff, um, search engine optimization, that you want to make sure that if, you know, it, um, let me think of an example, like, instead of saying virtual events, maybe your audience is looking for online events. And so those are things that um, you should consider when you're developing sort of your content and your keywords. Um, there's also sort of schools of thought of when you promote it, you know, is it in, you know, the hashtag you use. So there's, it's definitely, um, it can get complicated, but it's also key, it's every content is still keyword driven or hashtag driven. Do you recommend using a, like a template whenever you sit down to write blogs so that you, you hit all the check boxes? Because I always think about after it's posted and I'm like, oh, I should have said X, Y, and Z for my keywords. And I, and I just, um, I'm, you, I was wondering if you had any like tricks. You, I'm sorry to cut you off, but That's I what, definitely, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a template, but if there's certain keywords you want to 
hit just make sure you have that list and so you know how to integrate it. There's also the ability, like you were saying, like in hindsight, you're like, oh, I should have used those words of repurposing content. There's nothing wrong with repurposing a blog post. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on it a bit later, but the idea is that um, with anything that you create, it may have a longer shelf life than one and done. So um, if you don't you know, hit those keywords, it's definitely not a, oh no, I missed a, an opportunity. You can definitely revisit it. So. Thanks. You're welcome. That was a great question. Um, so where should I call home? So the, the idea back to what we were talking about is you're creating this content um, and in this instance it's a blog post and, and where should you post it? So one of the first things a lot of businesses do is create their online presence. So they look for a platform to host their website, to design their website. Um, and the, the great thing now is that there are a lot of different options out there that all offer different types of functionality that um, you might look for. And so, you know, obviously the, the basics of I need a place to actually host it and I need some sort of web template because I'm not a programmer or a developer. And so there's obviously a lot of other function to look beyond. And since we're talking about blog posts, um, I, I use the example of WordPress because it was originally designed and launched as a replacement for a discontinued blog service. So a lot of what they've continued to add on are features that are used um, primarily to support content development. So it's a really great choice for uh, anyone who's looking to consistently publish blog posts. Um, you'll look at other things like Shopify. They obviously are more of an e-commerce platform. And um, you know, there's definitely different things to look at beyond, like I said, the basics of web design and hosting. And obviously cost is always a, a, a consideration, but from a feature standpoint, definitely look and see what um, different platforms offer beyond the basics. So just the, the example uh, we were talking about, so this is WordPress. And so if you look at WordPress, you have the option to link your different social media accounts so that you can promote your content directly. So in this instance, you can write your blog post, you can publish it immediately, you can schedule it for a future date, and then um, it's all set. So, so along with where you decide you want to call home, how do you design your home? So this is, goes back to the graphics idea. So, you know, Canva is a very popular uh, app for graphic, do it yourself, graphic design, but there's definitely a couple of things that you want to ask yourself before you decide what graphic design app that you want to use. Can you post directly to the majority of social media platforms or at least the ones that you use you know, can you upload graphics directly to your other applications? So remember, you're building an app stack, so not a one and done. So how, how do these integrate with the other things that you use? And then, you know, can you easily edit, resize, and animate graphics to optimize content by tactic? What file types are supported? And of course, cost. Um, that's um, the number one thing. Canva has a pretty robust free version. But you know, ultimately, you have to decide if a free version gives you enough functionality or if it's worth the upgrade and, and cost. And so, you know, I you know, I feel like I'm a bit on Canva. So I'll talk about. There's a couple of other apps out there um, that uh, give you different options. So one of the limitations of Canva is that it doesn't allow you to edit your photos um, like like a Photoshop version. So there's another app called PicMonkey out there that actually allows you to edit photos. Um, the other option that is a limitation of Canva, but other apps may offer is um, you can't upload PDFs. And so there's another app that's called Designer, Designer with a Y out there that allows you to upload PDFs and into the, the sort of do-it-yourself graphic design. Um, so obviously nothing replaces professional graphic design, but there's definitely things to consider when you're thinking about how can I pick a, an app to go in my app stack um, if you need to, to sort of uh, DIY your, your design. So this is the example we talked about Canva. So you'll see the um, sites that you can publish directly to. And then the idea of whether or not you need to upgrade. So the free version of a lot of programs such as Canva might be good enough, but like if, for instance, this brand kit is something that would save you a lot of time, then it might be worth the I don't, whatever the dollar amount is to upgrade so that you don't have to keep going back in and, and you know, changing the colors or, 
um, you know, be having to use the standard features. So we have your content posted. Um, you have it designed, it's ready to go. So how do you promote it? So from an application standpoint, you know, there's a lot of ways you can do it. We, we sort of touched on things based on um, the apps that are out there, um, how you can, uh, you know, integrate them directly. But two ways that I'm going to just focus on is on social media or in an email campaign. So a lot of things come into play. So this is one of those things where um, I call it the order of operations. If you remember uh, math class, this, this section has a little bit of math reference, but you know, there's a lot of different ways you can utilize an app stack to promote your content. And once again, it's around like, what is your strategy? What is your, what you're, what are you trying to accomplish? And what, um, you know, that'll help drive what order you want to use your app stack. So whether um, you're scheduling the post or you're posting immediately, there's limitations around certain integrations that way. Um, do you need to optimize your content by platform? For instance, if you have a, you know, square image that you're using and then you post it on Twitter and you don't change the square image, it may get cut off or cropped in a way that you don't intend it to. Or for instance, you know, you may want to have a call to action that says the link in bio where that's not necessarily relevant in some of, like you might use that on Instagram, but you might not use that on Facebook because that's not necessarily how you have strategically decided how you want to promote the, the blog. Um, what social media platforms are you using? Um, the, the different integrations depend on, you know, if you're only using the basics um, versus if you're using some of the more, something that might be more niche. And what tactic within the platform? Are you posting to a story or a, a post? Those are, these are all things to sort of think about as you're, you're building your app stack and you're thinking about how or which ones to integrate in which order. Um, the other piece of around is, you know, are you you're, are you doing paid media or is this just going to be an organic post for your for your blog post? And then what type of media are you using? Like, is it only images? Is it only text? Is it only or will it also include a video? That sort of thing. And so I use the example of if you're given uh, Canva, WordPress, and Later as three apps that you're you have to use. There's a couple of different ways that you can think about integrating it. So this is sort of a, a a layman version of how to sort of integrate a couple of apps, but from a, if you're, you start with your graphic design in Canva, whatever it is, you can add it to WordPress, you can add it to a later account, and then from WordPress, you can go directly to Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and then later you can post on Instagram. That's one way you can sort of put the order of operations is you start with Canva, and then you add it to WordPress, and then you add it to later. Um, so some of the pros is that you can schedule all at once, right? You don't need to open every you know, go to Facebook, upload it to Facebook, go to LinkedIn, upload it to LinkedIn. So, th you know, that's obviously one thing that makes that this version beneficial. But like, as I mentioned before, that sometimes you might want to optimize content for a platform. So that square image that you're going to use on Instagram might not work well on Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever the case may be. Um, and then also just the way that WordPress is at least currently, you can't post directly to Instagram. So that is still one other thing that you would need to add into to your mix of steps. So that's one version you can use the same, those three apps. Another way you can think about, it, and this goes back to the order of operations is, can I go from Canva, post it to WordPress, and then Canva link directly to my social media platforms. And so, um, and then I just threw this out there because, you know, we, we use later in the, the previous example is another way you can use later is to update link in bio through later. And so the pros to using sort of the order this way is that you can resize images to be platform specific dimensions, right? You can make sure that um, everything will visually appear how you want it to appear. And you can also choose to post and or add to story versus WordPress is a, a sort of organic post link. The downside to doing this way is that there are limitations of using Instagram on desktop and, uh, and you can't schedule posts directly in Canva, I don't believe so. Um, one of the things that, um, and, and I'll talk about it, this is that I feel like at, at any given moment, these applications add new features. And so it's definitely something to, to keep into um, account or take into account as you're, you're continuing to, to look at your app stack. So any questions about, you know, sort of why the, 
order of operations or how to think about order of operations um, in terms of linking applications. Side fact, I also love math, so that's why I enjoy things like this. So I've read a lot about the algorithms that different social media apps use. And I'm just curious to know if you have any thoughts on posting topic in any of these particular uh, social media um, uh, sites that you mentioned. I mean, is there anything to it in terms of time of day, time of uh, day, to day of the week? I mean, or is it just the, the total number of postings? Is that, does that really override it? it? You know, what's the secret sauce behind that? Um, if I had the secret sauce, I probably would be a gazillionaire at this point. Um, no, I think there's definitely things to consider. One of the, the um, and I, I, I'm going to, I'm not going to quote the exact number because I'm probably going to misquote it, but um, from a Facebook perspective, I believe like less than 10% of your audience will see an organic post. And so reg regardless of um, a lot of different things, very few of your actual followers per se will see um, an organic post. So the idea is that you, you should post multiple platforms and at multiple times. So even if you are, sometimes it feels redundant to, to post the same thing on a Facebook or a Twitter or LinkedIn all at the same time, it might be worth it because you're, even if people are following each of those accounts, they might not see it on one of the platforms and they may see it on another. Um, in terms of like, you know, you know, time of day and there's, there's so certain things, a lot of, dip, you know, there's a lot of different schools of thought on like the best time to do it. There's a lot of things that you can test. I mean, like there, social media is one that's, um, I think not as easy for people. It, it's not as consistent as in like an email where there is definitely like concrete, like you can do a testing of like time because a lot of it is um, depending on other factors of the algorithm than just time of day, right? Like you were saying, like there's just so many different things that might impact it. So, you know, you might test at like 9 a.m. versus 9 p.m. And, and 9 a.m. wins, but it might also be because you have a certain keyword in there that, you know, that's what's driving it or something like that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I wish I had the, the secret sauce, the magic bullet, the, the answer to how do you get everyone to see your, your post and how do you get people to engage with it. But I think there's just a lot of nuance um, in dependent in particular on your, your product and your audience as well. Do you find greater success with email or social media? Uh, I'm sorry, Gary, you said success. Can you repeat your question? Sure. Do you find greater success with email or social media more? Uh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I think it, it depends, right? Like it, it's, um, there's just so many things that drive success, whether it's, um, you know, it, it, it depends on your audience. It depends on, you know, what you're promoting, what your goal is. Um, you know, I think there's value in both. Um, but, you know, without knowing spe your a specific situation, I, I wouldn't say one is better than the other. All right, so going back to math. So the basic equation, right? Um, so we talked about the, the idea of order of operations and I wanted to just give you sort of a, a live example of how to, to do the, the basic version. So um, we talked about in earlier, you know, you've created this blog post, um, you've linked your social media accounts. And so you can just simply share the post directly from um, WordPress into Twitter. So this is how it appears. This is obviously a live version from me, but just to give you the sense to close out that that example that we shared or that I shared earlier. Um, now we're getting into higher math, right? Differential equations. So we've we've gone beyond beyond the, you know, basic, uh, basic uh, order of operations. So I alluded to this after continuing trialing and adding new functionality. Um, one of the things that uh, I recommend doing is to, to subscribe to their emails if you're using a certain vendor or an app um, and regularly check for updates. Um, it, it may seem sort of tedious and, and, and regularly doesn't mean like every day. That's you know, obviously not what I mean. Um, but um, but you know, just on a, um, a, like a, a you know, quarterly basis, monthly, whatever makes sense for your schedule. 
Um, and so just from another standpoint, like I, I, if you have a, you know, a graphic designer and they're designing things in Photoshop, uh, MailChimp allows you now to integrate um, Adobe Photoshop into content into their content suite, which is basically your, your media library on MailChimp. And so the nice thing about that is, is that, you know, it's one less people step that has to happen. For instance, if you have someone that's doing work in Photoshop. Um, also in their content studio, they have a creative assistant beta. So basically it makes it easier for you to resize your content studio assets. So um, there's definitely things that, like I said, these, these vendors and these applications are, are trialing. Um, and one, Latest thing is um, later has just added TikTok to their suite. And so being able to integrate TikTok um, to your later account is something that they, they just recently added. Um, I see a question from Dawn. Um, can you share pros and cons of later versus Hootsuite, please? Um, I don't know if anyone else has experience. I don't have a lot of experience working directly with Hootsuite. Um, so I, I don't want to, I can't do a, a full pro and con. I will say um, Hootsuite is more of a professionally managed pro app than I, I think um, typically a lot of people who use later is it's a bunch of, you can use it in a much base, more basic level. So if you have sort of less experience, but like I said, um, if anyone else has any insights or comments they want to share, um, feel free to, to add them now or chat with John. Um, All right, so we talked a little bit about how business apps can also be integrated into your marketing. So, um, and, and then the other piece of this was like, how do you promote your content um, uh, through email? So the obvious way that you can promote your blog post through email is just adding a link in your email and sending it out. Um, but I think there's also creative ways you can integrate, integrate your business apps with your marketing efforts to promote your blog posts. So one of the things that um, you can do is with Calendly, you can schedule, obviously this, the Calendly app is about scheduling meetings and, and you know, that's sort of the crux of it. Um, and you can integrate your Calendly app into WordPress. But what also is interesting is that you can integrate MailChimp with all of this as well. So as you're scheduling, as your sales team or you as an individual are going out and scheduling these meetings, these leads come in and as opposed to sitting in an outside database and having to manage them through Outlook or Gmail or whatever email program you use, you can integrate them into MailChimp so you can integrate them into your marketing efforts. Um, there's a different schools of thought, but my personal opinion is if you're going to start sell, sending them promotional information or newsletters that um, are sort of more marketing emails that you should ask permission. Um, there's other schools of thought and a lot of people say if you've had an email communication that you can dump them into this list. That's something that you have to ask yourself, your legal team, your whatever you want to call it, what you're comfortable with. But, um, but the idea is that at least you have those leads in one place. So if you have the permission to email them, that you're able to, to send them promotional content. And you'll see why that's um, important. All right, so we've gone through the posting. Um, we've gone through the promoting. Um, so what else do you need to do with this? Um, everyone loves your content. There's some things that you can do. You can reuse and update. And this goes back to, I think, Joel's question earlier about or my response to Joel's question about, you know, if you forgot a keyword in a post, what to do. Um, you can also use it for follow-up and lastly, be inspired. So um, recycling content. I mean, the idea of a marketing app stack is all about efficiency, right? So there's things that you should look for in creating or in selecting apps. Look for ones that make it easy to repurpose content. Um, some other things that you should obviously keep in mind, like I said, this was more about apps, but I can't avoid some of these like, like nuggets and strategic advice is that choose content that performed well. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different analytical apps that you can use to measure whether it's native to the apps you're using. And I'll show you some examples in the, the next slide, but de definitely choose content that performed well. Um, and even though you may be able to just hit repost, take a minute, read it back, Make sure that it is relevant and make sure more importantly that it's appropriate for the current environment. While this isn't necessarily a blog post, but one example that recently came out was Kentucky Fried Chicken or KFC, I guess. Um, stop using finger licking 
good as their slogan because given the pandemic, they felt like that probably wasn't the uh, right message, but that's sort of the idea of making sure you yeah, take that minute to reread what you previously wrote. And the other piece is make sure that these stats that you have are, are current as possible, right? Like it's one of those things where um, if you have updated information, make sure it's updated. And if you want people to read your content, one of the best ways to do it is to have stats and data and information that no one else has on, on their site. So even if it seems like a, because just because no one else is saying it is kind of why you should say it. That's another reason if you, you know, going back to the keyword search where if you start, if someone's looking for, you know, how many Venture Cafe Philadelphia sessions there are every week. I'm just using that as an example. You can, um, and no one else has it on the website, but you have it on your website, then that's going to drive traffic to you. You'll be the first one there because you're the only one with that information. So this is my, um, what I alluded to in the earlier slide about different ways to look at um, analytics. So if you're looking at overall traffic or a high level overview, Google Analytics is a great option. If you want to look at sort of platform specific um, or sorry, content specific options, you can look at, for instance, WordPress stats, or if you want to look at content specific, you know, you look at your social media apps and they provide analytics as well. So that, that's all how you can sort of decide what content is doing well or how you're looking at it from a, a higher level. So I talked about um, follow up, right? Um, you know, marketing um, is about lead gen and conversion and, you know, all sorts of different things. So one of the things that um, I was taught growing up of was the sandwich method, which is basically how you deliver bad news, right? Good news, bad news, good news. So I think of marketing apps, business apps, is a way to sort of use that sandwich method, not necessarily they're dealing bad news, but for instance, you can start an email out that says something in relevant and interesting to your audience. Sandwich in the middle, here's your estimate or proposal, Here, here's the money that I want you to pay me, and then end it with something else to differentiate you. So as opposed to just having a flat, you know, estimate or proposal, you've, you've sandwiched it in between the value that you're gonna bring to them, so sort of framing it. I'm using this as an example, but this is how you can integrate something like a FreshBooks or a QuickBooks that allows you to invoice and, and send proposals and estimates with something with your marketing content from an application. So sort of App Stack 201, 2.0, whatever and beyond, there are a lot of different, more complicated ways of thinking about an, art, an App Stack. There's a lot of platforms like some of these that integrate, um, customer data that can connect any two apps that you want to so you don't have to rely on the native app to make that connection with the other app um, and all of, you know that that is sort of step two of all of it but just where the basics is think about what you can do it do on your own from a, a diy standpoint um, and what can you automate to make sure that um, you're using your time most efficiently um, um, and so, sorry, I just read Zay's comment. Um, I'll get to that in a second because I do, I do have some thoughts around that too. Um, and really, you know, take it beyond just sort of the basics. So I wanted to, to end on something that wasn't necessarily around an app stack, but about maximizing your content efforts. So uh, one of the things that I think is really important is to, to read as much as you can, watch as much as you can and listen, because really inspiration about anything can come from anywhere or anyone. Um, and I think it's really important to share, especially in the, sort of this time, like write, post, share. You never know who you might inspire, what, what they'll accomplish by, by listening to you. And so I, I just to circle back to Zay's comment of, you know, major advertisers will reuse the same piece of content a million times and little guys that we can only use it once. Um, I agree, but I also think that you should think of it as if it is meaningful and it has, it's gonna add value to someone's life, there should be no reason why you can't reuse it. It doesn't diminish the meaning. And if someone saw it once, great, you've reinforced it a second time. And if you've updated it once, twice, that's fine. There, there's still something new in it. Um, so the last thing I'd like to just close is um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I also know we have, I think, about ten min nine minutes left. So I'm welcome any questions, any comments anything anyone wants to share, any 
good stories with applications um, that you've enjoyed, uh, any fun anecdotes, any fun weekend plans. Um, Um, I'll, I'll give a couple little ideas. For those of you who are in really small business where cash and capital um, are very, you got to watch them closely. Uh, there's a, uh, a program called Direct Mail, which does send out mass emails for about the tenth of the cost of MailChimp. Uh, it's not as, as functional because you can't link it to a CRM like you can with MailChimp. But if your goal is just you got a mailing list of you know 500 or 5,000 people and you want to send them out an email once a month or whenever, um, it's a very inexpensive and easy to use uh, program called Direct Mail. I've been using it for about 10 years, um, and it's fine. The other thing I, I want to mention is that I think it's really hard and really important when you put out a piece of content. Try not to make it about you, but try to make it about something that you're listener or viewer can learn from and use. So you have to look at it from their perspective. In other words, I love putting out content that basically says, I'm great, Zay Smith is the world's greatest, but no one gives a shit. What I can do is put out a piece of content that maybe you can learn something or use for yourself and then that will reflect positively on me or my business. So that's what I try to do is try to make my content uh, either entertaining or educational or both. That, that is a great point. I think um, one of the sort of general learnings about a lot of marketing is, is you can beat your chest and say, I'm the greatest, bestest, whatever. I do know bestest isn't a word, just clarifying that. Um, but but that doesn't necessarily resonate with your audience. It is definitely, and, and there's a way to be, to show yourself as a thought leader and without being a sales pitch, um, which is actually one of the things I love about Venture Cafe too, is that, that you know, people here are, are here to, to learn and share, so. Um, I just wanted to add to the email services because we've, with my last company, we supported a lot of companies that use different um, plug-in mail services. And I was always amazed at how quickly uh, they got shut down uh, because people reported spam and, and then it just caused the whole um, campaign to crash. So just as a cautionary, you know, if you think you've got this great email list and you really don't have uh, proper credentials to use it, you're, you're probably going to end up with a big zero on the scoreboard. And um, we've used the Amazon simple email solution, which is ridiculously inexpensive, um, Zave, if you're interested in that. And um, it had very good success with that with our with our previous clients. What was Amazon that? Simple, Amazon Simple Email Service. It's on the AWS platform. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a, a a great point. I mean, like I said, from an email perspective, I always explicitly ask for permission. Um, Tracy and I worked on a campaign, and she'll appreciate this um, and probably understands why I say that because of exactly what you said, Joel. Is that um, it's very easy to to be caught in that spam trap, even as a, you know, just a cautionary note. Um, and there's a lot of email providers out there. The, the very first one I ever worked with, and this is not a recommendation, but just to give you some context, was this company called Nflyer. And I recently decided to Google to see if it still existed, because this was back in like 2000, and it, it does. But um, so I was, I was proud to see to, that that was still around, but there's definitely, you know, there's Clavio, there's Marcello, there's all sorts of ones. And so like the idea is like, how do, how do they work with what else you, you need to do? So there's definitely like in any part of business, a little cost benefit analysis. So yeah, it might be free and cheap, but if it's going to cause more headache down the line or with some other apps, then it might not be worth it, but, or vice versa. Um, you know, like right now you, you might just say, I don't have the cash to spend on anything. So I want the free version and, and that's better than nothing. So that makes sense as well. So, I mean, I think there's definitely, I mean, the, the, the challenges is to, to keep up with all the different options out there. And, and when you have the time to see if there's something um, that might add additional value to your, to your process. You know, I, I think as a business user, I'm always amazed when you get into deeper specialty function apps on the marketing side 
how incredibly complicated they can become. Oh, absolutely. And I always look for apps that work for the layman because especially as a, a startup entrepreneur, I'm trying to wear a lot of different hats and I don't have the deep domain expertise to really learn um, like a graphic, graphic apps, um, a graphic application. Some of them are just ridiculously complicated. So I'm, I don't yeah. know if anybody else feels this way. Maybe other people invest more time in learning apps. But for me, I just like to be able to like get through a quick tutorial and start using it. And then that becomes part of my stack. But if I have to invest a lot of time in it, I, I, even if it's free, I don't want to have to deal with it. Joel, I, I'm completely with you. Um, I run three companies right now. And my attitude in all three has always been keep the software as simple as possible. You know, we just like, you know, for us is Adobe Suite, QuickBooks, and the free, the couple things that come with the app operating system. You just keep it very simple. I see people with, you know, 10, 15 different software packages that do separate things for a small company. I'm going, who's got the time to troubleshoot that? Especially if you got more than one person working on it. So just keep it simple. I think that that's a great lesson across anything. Um, and even with some of the, the simple apps, you can, you can go down a rabbit hole for sure. Um, and so, um, you know, if it, if the, if it works, that's great, but you know, there's definitely ways to, to make sure that, um, you know, you, like Dave said, keep it simple. Um, especially, I mean, if it's not your, your core business. Yeah, I mean, I just launched a new website um, and I looked at, just did a quick review of all the website builders tools that are out there and um, I standard on, standardized on GoDaddy and I was amazed at all the plugins that were available to me with that website builder tool. Now, look, is that going to scale to support a, um, a, a growing business? Probably not, but Look, to get it out of the box and open it up, it was really wonderful. And not have to engage a web developer or or a consultant to build a website. It was it was really nice. It was a pleasure. Yeah, that's the, the exactly sort of the idea of the, the basic marketing app stack, right? Is like how can you really do it yourself? Um, and then when you're ready to to grow and scale or you know, whatever that might be, whenever that might be, that's when you start investing a little more time into to adding in different, you know, resources, whether or different hats, you know, when you need to wear a different hat. Uh, for those of you who don't notice, Dave is swapping out some um, headwear. But uh, all right, um, so I think we're at time. But uh, thank you guys so much um, for attending, um, and feel free to reach out um, if you have any other questions. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, um, and uh, I look forward to hopefully hearing from you, some of you soon. Interject really you. fast. Um, there's a link to the next session in the uh, in the in the chat box. So if you want to hit the next session, which is brand new, uh, it's with the uh, the team over there at Venture Cafe, um, join in.